All right, uh, we're going to get going here to finish up chapter six, and then we'll look at some chapter six examples. So uh, first thing here, I, I started talking about this a little bit in class, but the idea when you have objects connected over a single pulley like this, where it's one of those nice uh, massless pulleys that works real nice. Uh, essentially, what we want to do is just pick a direction and kind of bend it over uh, the axes when we start writing these equations out. So you can see it in the picture here. They've got the x direction right here going to the right, and then it's going down over here. So what they've essentially done is taken the x direction and then bent it around and had it follow the screen or the string, not the screen. So over here, x pointed down is actually the positive x direction, and up here to the right is the positive x direction. And then you basically treat it as though this were all just in a straight line, like you could rotate that part up this way and rotate all your forces so that they were pointing like this with your tension like that and everything like that. Uh, that's kind of the idea that you're having by there what you do with problems. Uh, and we'll see that when we get to the examples. All right. Uh, objects moving in a circular path, they have to have a force acted on them to make them turn. Uh, otherwise, you know, because turning is an acceleration, it's a change in your acceleration and therefore you need this. Uh, this is a force that is always pointed toward the center. So the acceleration is always toward the center, center of the uh, circular orbit. Uh, and so otherwise, if that force disappears, the object will just continue off in a straight line and not turn anymore. Okay, so oops. Oh, hold on. Sorry. And so anyway, uh, I was trying to do that, but I guess I'll just erase it. Uh, anyway, this will help kind of keep you going for uh, things that go in circular motion. You have to have that inward, you know, like center seeking force uh, going on there. All right, here is the actual center seeking force. It's called the centripetal force. Uh, and it's basically just like I said, it's a center seeking one. And so the force centripetal is the mass times the centripetal acceleration. So that's the, the corresponding acceleration. Uh, and that's just mv squared over r, which means that the centripetal acceleration is just v squared over r. So it's just how fast you're going, speed squared, uh, divided by the radius of your circle. Uh, obviously, the tighter the radius is, like the sharper the turn you're making, uh, this number gets smaller, which makes the overall force go up higher. And I think you've probably experienced this if you go around a corner and you turn too much, you know, like a sharp corner, you, you, you feel it a lot more than you go around a nice, long, slow bend. Uh, and then also, as the speed goes up here, uh, that force is also going to go up. And so the faster you go, the more you feel it as well. Uh, so you want to kind of slow down as you go around corners and stuff like that. So the, the total forces that you need to turn are not so big, especially you don't want the force to become so big that's required that the friction between your tires and the road can't handle it, and therefore you start to slide. Uh, here you can see a couple examples. One is uh, basically spinning a ball around in a circle around you, and you have that string that's attached to it, applying a tension, and that tension is always pointed inward toward the person's hand and so everywhere it goes the tension is always pointed inward and it's a centripetal force uh, something similar happens with gravity and the planets in orbit uh, as the planets orbit the sun gravity always is pulling them towards the sun and so you get a centripetal force there uh, here you can see in this picture that we can have centripetal force going with a car going around the turn and this time the centripetal force is provided by friction over here, the centripetal force was provided by tension. So a centripetal force can be gravitational, it can be tension, it can be friction, it can be magnetic, it can be all kinds of different things. Uh, the only thing it needs to be is it needs to be perpendicular to the actual direction of motion so that it causes this thing to turn and causes it to go in a uh, circular type motion. Okay. Uh, here we can have another circular force being applied. So more examples, this time it's not only friction, like you would probably have some friction going this way, but you also look here at this normal force. And if you break the normal force up into component, you can see that there's part of this normal force is pointed, uh, it's, it's pointed toward the center of the circle that's going on. Okay, so if we 
if we broke this up into components like this, we would see that this component right here in sine theta is actually pointed inward. And so if you had this situation, you could get something to turn even without friction, uh, but usually there still is some friction in there anyway, but this right here can contribute to uh, the, the, uh, the turning. So the normal force, at least a component of it, can uh, be part of the uh, centripetal force. And then here's another example where the normal force can be centripetal. When you're going through anything that's like going down through the bottom of a circular uh, dip in the road, or even if you were going over the top, like say over here, as you got up over here, and it was a, a, a it was a circular curve, you're, you would have normal force and you'd have gravity pulling you down towards it and everything like that, all contributing to that. So essentially to work these problems out, uh, what you're gonna basically do is take any, whatever total acceleration you have, this total acceleration, you're gonna break it into a component that is tangent to your motion. So in the, in, pointed in the direction that you're going, and then a component that is perpendicular, that is pointed toward the center that you're turning at. Uh, you add up all the vectors, some of all the vectors that are tangential, and then that can tell you the overall change in speed, and that's in acceleration tangential, and then you can sum up all the forces that are centripetal, that are pointed either directly straight in or directly straight out, because there can be multiple ones, uh, and that's going to be the ma centripetal, which is the mv squared over r, just like that. And so when you want to know the circular motion of something, figure out its radius and stuff like that, you add up all of the forces that are, that are perpendicular to that direction of motion that are either pointed directly in towards the center or away from the center, and you get a total net force pointed towards the center, and you can sum it up just like that. So it's very similar to what we were doing with summing forces. It's just this time uh, the object's direction is changing. <clears throat> so that's pretty much it for this chapter. Remember, we went through... Uh, kinetic friction, static friction, in particular static friction max, what tension was, what the force due to spring was, which was uh, Hooke's law. And then we went over here and we talked about translational equi equilibrium, uh, objects that are hooked together, that are going to move together like a train or those boxes that were tied together are going to have the same acceleration. We took advantage of that to figure out what the tension was between each one of them. Uh, and then lastly, we did the uh, centripetal acceleration, the circular motion uh, of an object going in a circle with a radius r at a speed v and a mass m. All right, so let's come back here. Let's look at a couple of these problems. So for this one, it says someone, and this one, I've, I've already written some of these out that I wanted to go through. So I'll just kind of walk you through them. But it says someone at the other end of the table asks you to pass the salt, feeling quite dashing. You slide, uh, you slide the 50 kilogram or 50 gram salt shaker in their direction, giving an initial speed of 1.15 meters per second. A, if the shaker comes to a rest with constant acceleration in 0 0.840 meters, what is the coefficient of kinetic friction between the shaker and the table? And then part B, how much time is required for the shaker to come to rest if you slide it with an initial speed of 1.32 meters per second? All right, so we're, we, let's go ahead and take a look at our picture up here. All right, I'm drawing a free body diagram of this. So here is that. And the forces we have acting on this is we have its weight pulling it straight down. So that's mg. We have the normal force pushing up on the table, canceling out that mg. And then we have our frictional force right here that's pointed in the opposite direction of the velocity. And again, notice that I drew that arrow for the velocity different and it's not connected to the object there because that is not a force. All right, so these are our three force vectors here. So if we look in the purely vertical direction, in the y direction, so like that, uh, we have two forces. We have the normal force minus the weight, but the weight is pointed down. And remember, we use a positive 9.8 for that one because we took care of the negative with that minus sign right there. Uh, vertically speaking, this thing is not moving up or down or anything like that, so it's not accelerating vertically. So this goes to zero and it just equals zero, which means in this situation, which is pretty common when we have a horizontal surface and the only forces we have acting vertically are the weight and the normal force, uh, then the weight will equal the normal force. If we look at the horizontal equations in the x direction, 
we see that F sub X equals MA, and we only have one, one force uh, acting, uh, acting in that direction, that's F sub K. So that's what we put right there. And then it equals MA. Well, if you remember, we've done this a couple times. Uh, if you, if you uh, work it out right here, you can see that from the kinematic equations, from this VF squared equals VI squared plus 2A delta X, that you can solve down and find that the acceleration uh, going to, you know, from some initial speed to a, to a rest position or rest speed, uh, that this is what the acceleration turns out to be. We've done that a few times now. And so I took that and I plugged it in right there for the acceleration. So this is our equation right here. Um, this is our equation right here for it horizontally, F sub K equals uh, negative M V I squared over two Delta X. Okay. And so if we come down here, uh, we can take advantage of some of these uh, relations we had. So first off, we know that uh, we're given a constant acceleration. We're told what that is. We're given what the distance is it stops and we're given the initial velocity, the final velocity, we're not given time. Uh, so for an acceleration thing, we have at least three out of the five. We can start to solve this. Uh, we can figure out what the total frictional force is by simply doing the coefficient of friction right here times the normal force, which allows us to then say that the coefficient of friction is just that ratio of the frictional force over the normal force. We found that the normal force equals mg, or right here equals mg, so I replaced that with mg. And we also found that the frictional force was m negative vi squared over two delta x. So I substitute that in for the friction and that in for the normal force in the bottom and the masses cancel. And then you're left with negative vi squared over two delta x divided by g, which is negative vi squared uh, right here, negative VI squared over 2G delta X. And so we can plug numbers into that and you plug those numbers in and that should tell you then uh, what the, uh, the coefficient of the kinetic friction would be if you plug these numbers into your calculator. Be sure to square this, then take the negative. All right, be careful of that so that this negative will cancel with this negative. Now you notice right here, um, right, anyway, whatever, let's keep going. So part B, it says how much time is required for the shaker to come to rest if you slide it with an initial speed of 1.32 meters per second. So we know that our frictional force or our horizontal forces, uh, our frictional force times MA, our frictional force is the coefficient of friction times the normal force, which means our acceleration is mu k n over m, but n we found earlier is just mg, so I make that substitution. The mass is canceled, so if you look at that, that's pretty interesting that the mass of the object doesn't matter for how long it will take for it to slide to stop. All right, that's that's kind of a big deal. If we had, you know, if this if we doubled the mass of the salt shaker, it wouldn't change how long it would take for it to slide to a stop given the same initial speed. Uh, and so that's, that's a pretty interesting idea there because uh, again, what happens is you, you increase the mass and then that increases the normal force, which increases the friction. So you're both increasing the inertia by increasing the mass, but you're also increasing the frictional force by increasing the mass and they exactly cancel out. And so we end up with the acceleration is just the coefficient of friction uh, times G, and then you can plug your numbers into that and get your answer. Since we just found the coefficient of friction right up here, well, we almost found it. We didn't, we didn't quite finish it. Uh, but you find this coefficient of friction and you'd plug it in right there and plug in 9.8 for the acceleration due to gravity right there. Okay, and then you, could, you can figure out uh, what the acceleration is. After that point, you go back to the regular old kinematics right here, which kind of ran out of room for doing but you get the kinematics right there where you have an acceleration, which we just found. Uh, we don't know a delta X. We know an initial velocity. We know a final velocity. That's three of the five. We want to solve for time right there. So that's a, that becomes then at that point, just a chapter two question uh, that you should be able to go through and solve. All right. And if I'm going too fast in any of this, please go back and just 
um, you know, just, just watch it again, slow it down, pause and think about it as I do this. Okay, that one was an interesting. This one's pretty interesting. So it says a flatbed truck slowly tilts its bed upward to dispose of a 95 kilogram crate for small angles uh, of the tilt, the crate stays put. But when the tilt angle exceeds 23.3 degrees, the crate begins to slide. Uh, what is the coefficient of static friction between the bed of the truck and the crate? So this is what's happening here. We are increasing the angle of the truck. And therefore, as we do that, the component of gravity of its weight pointed down is getting to be more and more. So like if our angle was like this, our component of gravity would be even bigger. It's closer and closer to being all of gravity to the point that you get vertical. And then the component down, it is just mg. It's, it's the full gravity right there like that. And of course, as you get horizontal, gravity becomes purely perpendicular and there's no horizontal force. So it's this force right here that's trying to make it slide down the ramp. And as, sine, as theta gets bigger, that force gets bigger. Then we'll have a frictional force that's opposing that. Now, as long as the object isn't sliding and we're increasing the angle, what happens is that force down the ramp keeps increasing, but the force of friction holding it up, right? This is our frictional force. This is the mg sine theta there. Uh, they keep canceling each other out as we get to greater and greater angles. But eventually you reach a point where that friction force cannot hold it up anymore. And that's the peak of that graph right there. And they tell us what angle that's at. They tell us that's at 23.3 degrees. Uh, and as soon as you go past that, you fall into that kinetic zone and it starts to slide. So uh, we wanna try and take advantage of that to figure out then uh, what the coefficient of static friction is between the crate and the truck bed. So let's start by writing out our equations and we're gonna do this right at the point where it starts to slide. So when theta is 23.3, that gives us the static frictional maximum. So in the X direction, which I've pointed down the inclined plane there, uh, we have zero acceleration at that point because we're doing this right before it starts to slide. So if we stay right there at 23.3, it doesn't slide. If we go any bit above it, it starts to slide. So we'll have a net force of zero uh, we have two forces acting in the x direction. We have the mg sine theta component pointed down the ramp. That's this one right there. And then we have the frictional force maximum pointed up the ramp in the opposite direction of the attempted motion. And then those will equal zero. Uh, I can then go to the vertical equation and I can see vertically I have a normal force and then I have this component of the weight mg cosine theta. And again, there's no acceleration in the y direction because it's not jumping up off the incline, off the, you know, the truck bed, it's not crashing down through it. So that'll be zero as well. And so I'll have the normal force in the positive direction and then minus mg cosine theta in the negative direction equals zero, which tells me the normal force is mg cosine theta. Now over here, uh, if we come back to the x direction, we don't know what that frictional force is but we do know what the normal force, and we know that the normal force is rated, uh, related to the frictional force by the coefficient of uh, static friction. So if I come back over here and I say, this is my relationship between static friction and the coefficient of static friction and the normal force, uh, I can substitute in for the normal force mg cosine beta, which we found right there, okay? And then I can see that the static frictional force is mu times mg cosine theta. And if I take that and I come back over here and substitute it in right there, now I have mg sine theta minus mu mg cosine theta. And looking at that, I know what the mass is, I know what g is, and I know what theta is, mass g theta. So the only thing I don't know in this equation is the coefficient of static friction, which is the one thing I actually want to have. So if I go through and start to solve this, I add the mg cosine theta, the mu mg cosine theta to both sides. Uh, at that point, I can cancel out the mgs, it's on both sides. And then I can divide both sides by cosine theta, which tells me that the static coefficient of static friction is simply sine theta divided by cosine theta, which means the coefficient of static friction is simply the tangent of theta, which is an extremely simple result to get. 
All right, we did all this bunches of math, but look how easy that is. So if we wanted to go in and repeat this experiment for different crates or different objects to see when they would start sliding down and figure out what the coefficient of static friction is between those other crates or those other objects and the bed of that truck, then all we have to do is lift this up until it just starts to slide. Take that angle that it just starts to slide at and just take the tangent of that angle. And that will tell us what the coefficient of friction is. So here the answer is just gonna be the tangent of 23.3 degrees. If we replace that crate with a different crate, maybe one that's slippier that starts to slide at 15 degrees, then the coefficient of friction between that new crate and the ramp, the, the ramp of the truck there, the truck bed, would be the tangent of 15 degrees. I believe I said 15 degrees. All right, and you can just go through and do this very quickly without reworking this all out a whole bunch of times. So this is also a good example of why I like to wait and not plug numbers into the end, because you oftentimes, a lot of times, can get a very simplified result there. You also notice that the point at which this slides then is purely based on the angle and the properties of the surface. It doesn't even matter what the actual weight of the object is. It doesn't matter uh, what the acceleration due to gravity is, uh, where you're doing it. So if you did this experiment on Earth with the gravity, uh, with an acceleration of gravity of 9.8 meters per second squared, and then you went to the moon with the exact same truck and crate and everything, uh, where the acceleration of gravity is like one sixth of what it is here, uh, and you started doing the experiment again where you lifted this up slowly, it would start to slide at the exact same angle because the only thing that matters for the coefficient of friction is just the angle, all right, just for when it starts to slide. Okay, uh, another one that's interesting to look at is this one. So this is a, a suspended problem. We did some of these already in the last chapter, uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this one, but now we're talking about the tension of these things, and we're using the tension to hold these up. So we have a tension at this angle and a tension at this angle. Uh, we break them into components. This is the only one that needs to be broken into components because this one's purely in the X direction. So this one we break into an X component and a Y component. And then we sum up the forces in each direction. This thing is static. So I have the tension with the wall and the tension with the rope to the ceiling. Uh, that's what TW and TC stands for. This thing is static. So, excuse me, both of the accelerations are zero. And then we've got uh, in the, we've got in the x direction we have two forces we have t cosine theta this one right there that is pointing to the right and then we have the tension in the rope with the wall which is pointed to the left right there and then they're each in different directions so it's one of them minus the other and that equals zero then we can come over here for the uh, vertical direction and we can see that vertically we have two forces we have the tension this one right here uh, tc sine theta and then we have the weight right there and so TC sine theta is vertical, MG is negative because it's pointed straight down. So this one's pointed up, this one's pointed down. They equal zero because this is an accelerating up or down. And so TC equals MG sine theta. So that right there tells us what the tension in that rope on the right is going to be, which means we can just plug in numbers there and, and get an answer right there. And that would be our answer for the tension in that rope. To get the tension in the other rope, uh, you notice right here, the last the relationship we stopped on right there required us to know TC. So take that, plug it in right there for TC, and just solve this for TW. And it turns out that the tension with the string on the wall is just mg over tangent of theta. Plug in your numbers and get your result right there. And those would be your two answers. Just plug in the given numbers. Okay. Uh, let's see if I had some other ones. Yes, this one. Here's one of connected blocks over a pulley. Uh, you can see here that I've done what I said I was gonna do where I took the X axis and I bent it around here. So this is the positive X direction and this is the positive X direction, All right? And so that's gonna be very important so that our sets of equations match up when we do the equations for each one of these individually. So looking at just this first one right here, I can just do a dotted line right there's like my free body diagram of it. Uh, you can see I have three forces acting on it. I have the normal force acting up in the y direction. I have the weight acting downward in the y direction. And then I have the tension acting in the positive x direction. If I come look at this one, I have just two forces acting on it. 
I have the tension, which is pulling up on it, but that's our negative x direction. And then I have its weight, which is pulling down on it, but that's our a positive x direction. All right, so I don't even have to worry about a y direction for that hanging mass. So if we come back over here, I can do three different equations. I can do the net force on block one, which is this horizontal one up here. So the net force in the x direction, in the x direction, we only have one force, which is the tension. And so that will equal the mass of that block times the uh, acceleration of that block. We can do the vertical or the y direction uh, forces on that first block. And again, we have the two forces. We have the normal force pointed up, and then we have nine, minus mg because the weight is pointed down, or m1g for the first mass of the first object. And so that'll equal zero again because we have no acceleration in the y direction. I can write a third equation for this block over here. Uh, I only have forces acting in the x direction, which in this case is vertical and positive pointed down, which means that uh, I have m2g, which is our positive direction in this problem, and then minus t, which is our negative direction. And notice this t and this t are the same because it's the same rope connected across the pulley that's not interfering it. And then that will equal the mass of block two times its acceleration. Now, since these two things are hooked together, this acceleration and this acceleration over here, the acceleration for both blocks will be the same, but their masses are different. So the forces on them will be different. Uh, if I come along here, I can say that I figured out that the tension was m1 times a sub x. And so I can substitute that over into here for the tension. So it's m2g minus m1ax equals m2ax. And then if we look at that, we know the masses of both of them. They're given, right? Mass one, mass two. And we know the acceleration to gravity. So the only thing we don't know in this equation is the acceleration in the x direction for these two objects, which will be the same. So I go through, do some algebra here and solve it for that acceleration. And it turns out it's just m2g divided by m1 plus m2, which kind of should make sense to you since the only force that's making them move ultimately is the weight of m2. The weight of m1 is not going to cause it to move in the x direction. So it's the weight of m2, but that weight of m2 is moving both m1 and m2. So the force we have total is the weight of that object, but the total mass that has to get moved is m1 plus m2. So we end up with that right there. It's kind of like uh, if you solve for ma equals you know, F equals MA and you solve it for that A, you get that. Uh, then the last part is what is the tension in the rope? Well, we can simply take our acceleration that we just found what it was and plug it right back in there for acceleration. And that'll tell us that this is the overall acceleration right here. Notice we end up with M1 times M2G. So that's the, you know, that's adding on to that total uh, tension, depending on how big M1 is and how big M2 is. And then again, it's divided by that right there. So these answers should hopefully make some kind of sense to you uh, and tell you exactly then, you know, what's going to happen with this one as you do it. But again, don't forget that bending the axis across that, uh, you know, around the pulley like that. Okay. Uh, here's another very uh, interesting one. This is called an Atwood machine. We're actually going to do a lab on this one. Um, uh, it's coming up pretty soon. But basically the idea is you have a pulley and you suspend two weights over it of different masses and you let them go. The heavier mass will start to drop and the lighter mass will rise. And then you can basically figure out then how much forces are acting on them. And it actually becomes a very uh, nice way experimentally a very accurate way to find the acceleration due to gravity if you measure what the actual accelerations of the objects are uh, and then that allows you to calculate g but here uh, we're asking we're asked to find what the actual acceleration is so we're not finding the acceleration due to gravity we're assuming we know that and we have to find the uh, total acceleration so each of these objects are only purely moving in our x direction which i've bent across like that so this is the positive x direction on this side. This is the positive x direction on that side. So for this mass over here, mass one, up is the positive x direction. And for this mass, mass two over here, down is the positive x direction. So I can do my net force on object one. 
uh, it's only moving in one direction, the x direction, so I don't have to worry about the y direction. And that's going to be the net force equals M1A. Uh, so this will be the tension, which is in the positive direction, minus its weight in the negative direction. And that'll give us M1A, which is not zero here in this case. Uh, unless the two masses were identical, then we would expect that it would become zero. But assuming they're not, there's going to be some acceleration. And so the tension in the rope is just M1A times M1G. If we go over here for the second mass, we can write its net force. Here, we reverse the signs on our things because now the weight is in the positive direction on this side and the tension is in the negative direction over here because again, down is the positive X direction. Uh, I just found what the tension was over here so I can substitute that in right there. And that gives me M2G equal uh, minus M1A plus M1G equals M2A. And so you can go through, follow my algebra right here and solve for what the acceleration is. And the acceleration is purely in terms of the masses of the two objects and the acceleration due to gravity. So you can plug those numbers in and get a, what it equals to, you know, using the given numbers, 3.1 kilograms, 4.4 kilograms uh, and so on and figure out what the overall acceleration is of the two uh, masses, just like that. All right, and notice if we said that the masses were the same, uh, you know, I'd like you to look at what would happen to this acceleration if the two masses were the same, okay? Uh, let's see what you think happens if this is a good value or not. All right, here's another one. Here's rounding a corner. So this is a centripetal force problem. Uh, they tell us a 1200 kilogram car rounds a corner of radius 45 meters. Uh, the coefficient of static friction between the tires and the road is 0.82. What is the greatest speed the car can have going around the corner without skidding? So uh, for this problem, we're interested in the centripetal acceleration. So that's all the forces pointed in or out, uh, you know, in radially or out away from the center of the circular path. So the net force centripetal, probably could have written that centripetal there, CP, I think we were using CP, is going to be M times the centripetal acceleration. Well, the only force acting centripetally on this car here is the frictional force between the tires of the car and the round and the road. Uh, so that's the only centripetal force right there. Let me go back to my little laser pointer thing. That's the only centripetal force right there. And then that equals MV squared over R. Now, uh, if we take a look, we know that the coefficient of, or that the, the static friction force has to be equal to uh, the coefficient of friction times the normal force. So we need to figure out what the normal force is. So if we look at this object, like if, if we took and took a side view of this car, we would have the car on the road, we'd have the normal force pointed up and we'd have MG pointed down. And those would be the only two forces acting on our car in the vertical direction which means vertically speaking, uh, N minus MG has to equal zero. Those are our two vertical forces in the y direction, which means N equals MG. So our normal force equals our weight because we have that situation where we're on a horizontal surface and the only vertical forces are the normal force and the weight, so they equal each other. So we come back over here and we say the static friction max is equal to mu times the normal force. The normal force is simply MG. So our static force is m is mu s mg. So I can take this, or actually, I'm sorry, take this part and substitute it in there for the static frictional maximum. And then that becomes mu s mg. The m's will cancel. And then you can solve for v. Uh, just do a little algebra, multiply both sides by r, take the square root. And you get that the speed is equal to the square root of the coefficient of static friction times g times the radius of curvature. You can plug those numbers in. And when you do, you should get something around 19 uh, meters per second for that one. That would be the maximum speed you could go before you would start to slide. OK. Uh, another one here. This one is a banked turn. So in this one, uh, we have a car rounding a corner. Uh, and there's no assistance from friction. So in other words, right, without any assistance from friction, so we can neg uh, negate the friction or ignore it. And it's going around a banked curve. So it's on an inclined plane like this. 
that means our forces acting on it are its weight straight down and its normal force up at an angle perpendicular to that surface. Now we're gonna have one component of that normal force pointed in radially. This will be our centripetal force. And then we're gonna have one component of that weight pointed up vertically. That's going to be our vertical force to cancel out with our weight. All right, so we want the net force parallel to the, to the radius of the circle. So this is the radius of the circle right there. That's our net force that's parallel to it, that's pushing us around in the circle. So therefore the centripetal force right here, just like we did before, FC equals MAC, there's only one force and that's the inside theta force right there. Oh, and by the way, you can show that this angle theta right here is the same as this angle theta up here. I think we've done that before, but you know, make sure you, you, you understand that those two are the same. So we get end up with n sine theta equals mv squared over r. And uh, we can start to, we need to, well, we can start, but we need to figure out what the normal force is. So we look at our, uh, we look at our vertical equation or our y equation, our equation for perpendicular, or actually purely vertically. We're not even doing perpendicular to the inclined plane here. Uh, and we're doing this because this object is, not moving up or down. It's not going up or down, further up or down the inclined plane. Uh, so we're just using purely up and down. We're not doing the thing where we made the x-axis point down the rope and the y-axis perpendicular to it. So we left the x and y just like they were because we have no acceleration up and down uh, the inclined plane. And then we look at that, we can see that we have mg pointed downward, that's minus mg. And we have n cosine theta pointed straight up. That's the n cosine theta. It's a positive right there. And again, we have no acceleration in that y direction. This car isn't moving up or down in, at all. And so that acceleration is zero. And therefore, our normal force equals mg over the cosine of theta. Just a little bit of, uh, just a little bit of uh, algebra right there and get you that. I also drew a nice little better picture right there, which you can look at in the notes and see. Uh, for just finding the triangle for the normal force right there, okay? Or finding theta for it, which we talked about, we've done before, and that's 90 minus theta, and so that has to be theta. But anyway, uh, so we get what the normal force is, is mg cosine theta, which we know those things. We know the angle of the track, we know the mass of the car, and we know the acceleration due to gravity. So we can take that, bring it back over, plug it in there for the normal force, and you get mg, uh, you get mg sine theta over cosine theta equals mv squared over r. The masses cancel. So yet again, we don't care what the mass is. As the mass increases, so does the normal force. And then so therefore, uh, so does the uh, centripetal force. And so interesting, the mass cancels out, which again, if you're plugging numbers in at the very beginning, you might not notice that that happens. So it's best to solve this stuff out this way and see more of the physics. Uh, sine theta divided by cosine theta is just tangent of theta. And so you get g tan theta equals v squared over r, which means theta just equals the arc tangent of v squared over g times r. So that's a pretty simple result we get right there uh, for how, uh, you know, uh, for what angle we have to bank this at in order to make that term purely under the normal force with no friction. Uh, so you plug your numbers in that are given and you get 26.27, or not, not 26.7, 26.7 degrees about right there, okay? I don't know if I picked out any others to do, but I did do a few practice problems from the practice problems here, like here's number four, if you wanna take a look at it. Uh, I believe it's a guy sliding into a, a base uh, in baseball. Uh, I did this one, which with practice nine, which again had to do with centripetal acceleration and motion like that. So take a look at this one, it's pretty interesting. I did a few other ones. Here's a practice 14. This is a, this is a pulley and an inclined plane. So this combines both of those aspects, the inclined plane problems and the pulley. So it's good to look through that one. Uh, look at the practice problem and go through that one. And then like any other ones I think I did in here as well. Uh, you can take a look through and see uh, how I did them. Okay, so I think that's going to be pretty much it for this video. Uh, if any of it was too fast for you, you can go back, pause it, rewind it, listen to it over and over again until it makes sense to you. All right, that's it for now then. Thanks very much.